Just a quick reminder that the uh, energetics of performance uh, depend on these three energy systems. The phosphagen system, during that first 10 seconds um, of exercise. Uh, the lactate system, which depends on glucose, um, and produces lactic acid after glucose metabolism, which lasts for uh, mm, two to three minutes. Uh, and then fat and glucose metabolism for aerobic metabolism, uh, and that's going to last for hours or up to days. So an important principle. Most of the energy from our body is obtained through nutrition. Um, and the energy that we use or generate is, um, is, gives us the capacity to do mechanical work. That's work with our muscles. It is generally expressed either as joules um, or as calories. Now, one calorie is equal to 4.186 joules, and joules is a unit of energy. Inside your body, uh, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, uh, is the currency of energy inside of our muscle cells, and we need ATP to be able to complete muscle contractions uh, and to produce work. So how are we going to measure the energy content of foods? Um, food energy is stored as either carbohydrates fats, um, or proteins. Um, they all have energy stored in chemical bonds. So to determine the energy content of foods, a method called uh, calorimetry is used, direct calorimetry, uh, to measure the food's uh, energy content. Food is combusted or oxidized, and heat is measured. This uh, measurement is usually taking place in a bomb calorimeter, and this gives us a measure of the chemical energy of the food. So we know how many calories are present in that food. Now, on the other hand, when we're uh, uh, doing uh, work, we're outputting mechanical energy, either walking or running or throwing or jumping or some other form of exercise, um, work is, uh, is required uh, and energy is, is used. And that work is measured um, in physics terms, in terms of the force applied over a distance. Okay? That is also measured as joules or, or calorie. Now, work over a unit of time is called power. So power is work per unit time. It's uh, joules per second. Um, you might see it also called watts. You'll see watts. For example, this athlete working out here on the rowing machine um, is uh, doing work over time. Work is force times distance, applying force um, and moving the handle at distance, um, and that will be measured here um, by watts, the number of joules per second that this athlete is outputting, and that can be directly compared uh, to the calories being burned. So there we have it, the energy systems, once again, the phosphocreatine system in that first 10 seconds, the anaerobic glycolytic system um, up to several minutes, and the aerobic uh, systems where we're burning uh, glucose uh, and glycolysis and fat, uh, which is called lipolysis. Um, mixed sports require both the anaerobic, um, the phosphagen system, and, and the aerobic uh, glucose burning, fat burning systems. Um, yeah, right here at the bottom you can see capacity to produce power. The phosphagen system, you can produce a lot of power, but you can only do it for an extremely short period of time. The anaerobic system, you can generate a moderate amount of power uh, in the middle, um, but you, you can only do that for two to three minutes at most. Uh, and then the aerobic system, you can produce a lower level of power, um, but you can do that for many, many hours. Now, when we break down the energy systems used by sport, uh, you can see that it varies dramatically. So you, you can look up your sport here, but you'll see, for example, dance um, is a sport that is largely aerobic, uh, but does have some anaerobic uh, capacity and some uh, explosive elements. Uh, baseball, on the other hand, is largely an anaerobic sport. Um, uh, phosphocreatine, explosive resistance sport. Uh, and you can see down here, if we go and take a look at something, for example, like soccer, a mixed sport, you can see soccer is very evenly balanced between the phosphagen system at 
and the uh, anaerobic system 20% and aerobic systems 30%. So this uh, sort of mixed sport requires uh, focusing on nutrition uh, for um, the phosphagen system, uh, anaerobic system, and the aerobic uh, carbohydrate and fat burning systems. Um, swimming, largely aerobic. Okay, so the phosphagen system, how does it work? The phosphagen system re uh, relies on a molecule called phosphocreatine. We can load our body with uh, creatine by either taking a supplement, a creatine supplement, uh, about three to five grams per day uh, during your uh, competition phase, uh, or uh, by eating uh, meat. Uh, creatine is found as an amino acid in, in a lot of meat products. Uh, we store about 10, maximum 30 seconds of uh, energy when um, supplemented uh, with phosphocreatine in, in the muscles. And muscles uh, will become slightly larger uh, because phosphocreatine requires hydration for its storage. Um, so there'll be some additional water retention uh, in, in muscles uh, when uh, phosphocreatine levels are high. Glucose, on the other hand, um, is the energy that is the preferred source for your brain, for your nervous system, and for your muscles. Um, this is the number one fuel in the body. Uh, it will be broken down into carbon dioxide and water, uh, producing ATP. Um, if oxygen is limiting uh, in that first one to three minutes, um, you'll get pyruvate production, and that's converted to, to lactic acid um, with lower levels of ATP production. So here is the anaerobic system. Glucose is being broken down into pyruvate, the six carbons being clipped in two and turned to pyruvate three to three carbon compounds uh, with the production of some ATP to fuel your muscles. Uh, that pyruvate is then further converted to lactate, another fuel. Lactate can be broken down in the citric acid cycle uh, uh, later on, uh, but that produces another uh, two ATP molecules, and these uh, ATP molecules can be uh, used um, by, by your muscle cells to uh, generate power. Uh, however, this uh, can only last for about one to three minutes um, before the lactate levels get too high and you have to discontinue your uh, exercise. Glucose, uh, on the other hand, is stored in two places. It is stored in the liver uh, and it is stored in the muscle. Um, it is stored as a polymer uh, of glucose molecules um, called glycogen. Uh, glycogen is stored in both locations. There is a about 500 grams of glycogen in the muscles, about 100 grams of glycogen uh, in the liver, and this can be broken down to produce uh, glucose very, very rapidly. Glucose uh, enters the bloodstream and then supplies uh, muscles with glucose, uh, but glycogen in the muscles is also broken down into glucose 6-phosphate, and that provides energy directly in the muscles. It's really important to keep your glycogen levels topped up through sufficient carbohydrate in your diet. Now the aerobic system uses, the carbo uses carbohydrates, uses fats, it uses oxygen um, to burn carbohydrates and fats. Um, the first choice of the aerobic system is, um, is both these carbohydrates and fat metabolism uh, to produce ATP, and it requires quite a lot of oxygen, um, so that's why you have to uh, breathe heavily to uh, burn these uh, fuel sources. You'll also see that protein is, uh, is a fuel source. Protein um, can become a fuel source when insufficient carbohydrates are present. When insufficient carbohydrates are present, uh, the body um, will start to convert um, either dietary protein, but more problematically, muscle protein in your body will start to convert, um, to convert that into amino acids. Those amino acids will get converted into glucose, and that glucose will get burned um, in aerobic metabolism. So you'll start losing muscle mass in the absence of sufficient carbohydrate, in the absence of sufficient glucose. So it's really important during your sporting events to avoid this by making sure that your carbohydrates are topped up during your sporting, sporting events. Um, that will prevent muscle breakdown 
and you don't want to lose muscle. If you start losing muscle, you're going to start losing sport performance. Fats. Uh, fats are stored uh, in layers underneath the skin, um, but fats are also stored within um, muscle. So let's take a look at um, the storage systems here just for a few seconds. Okay, first of all, the uh, phosphagen system, that creatine phosphate, gives us 10 to 30 seconds of power, um, maybe up to, up to 30 seconds if we're supplementing. The uh, initial uh, glucose burning, uh, turning it into pyruvate, the anaerobic system with insufficient oxygen available, uh, breaking it down into pyruvate and then into lactic acid. Um, that's going to give us one to three minutes of power. Uh, and then the liver glycogen and the muscle glycogen can be burned aerobically in the presence of oxygen. And that's going to give us up to about two hours of, of uh, power production. Uh, so long as our glycogen levels are uh, topped up through good nutrition uh, and so long as we keep supplying the body with more glucose. Then fat metabolism can, particularly um, fats in both the muscle uh, and uh, adipose tissue that's um, stored underneath the skin at various locations around the body, um, that can provide us with uh, thousands of uh, uh, kilocalories of energy. This can last uh, days, if not weeks. Um, we don't want to be using our muscle protein for energy. We don't want to be converting that into, uh, into glucose. We want to spare our muscle uh, protein. And to do that, we need to keep our glucose levels topped up during our exercise, even during our endurance exercise and ultra-endurance exercise. In terms of energetic efficiency, the human body is not very efficient. Only about 20% of the power, um, uh, the energy that is in, in, uh, in our foods are, is converted to power. Most of it becomes heat. And that heat is partly used to maintain our body temperature, um, but most of that heat is dissipated into the environment. Uh, with various uh, heat dissipating mechanisms, um, things uh, like sweating, for example. So we can measure, um, we can make a couple of different measures of energy expenditure for athletes. There are two different methods I'm going to talk about. There's going to be direct calorimetry. Um, this requires a specialized chamber for measuring how much energy is being put out. And then we'll look at some breath-by-breath -breath systems, which is indirect calorimetry, where we're measuring oxygen and carbon dioxide production. So this would be a calor calor calorimeter chamber. The calorimeter chamber, the athlete will be working out, the athlete will be pro producing, um, will be doing work. Um, uh, that energy um, is being measured as heat output. So the oxygen and carbon dioxide being supplied to the athlete will be measured. And these uh, copper pipes uh, with a thermometer and heat exchanger will be measuring changes in temperature. Uh, and through measurement of changes in temperature, we can estimate exactly how many uh, calories the athlete is burning uh, during different uh, exercises. Indirect calorimetry, on the other hand, um, looks at the biochemistry uh, of what's going on, and, and it's referring to the indirect measurement of oxygen uh, and carbon dioxide, um, rather than the direct measurement of heat. Um, this would be the setup for measuring oxygen and carbon dioxide. An athlete will be uh, uh, taking in oxygen, blowing out carbon dioxide and residual oxygen, and that will be measured. Uh, indirectly, um, and through that we can indirectly um, make some estimates of both the substrates that are being used and the amount of energy that is being burned. This would be a typical indirect calorimetry setup. You might have seen this sort of thing, athletes working out in this in this way. It can give us a pretty accurate estimate of energy expenditure. The athlete here is breathing out carbon dioxide and, and, and uh, taking in oxygen, and that's being uh, measured here. So the respiratory quotient um, is an important measure. Uh, for example, if an athlete is burning glucose, uh, they'll be taking in six molecules of oxygen, producing six molecules of carbon dioxide. That produces a respiratory quotient of six carbon dioxides to six oxygens, a respiratory quotient of one. On the other hand, if a fatty acid, a 
fat like palmitate is being used. Uh, you can see that burning this molecule requires 23 molecules of oxygen and produces 16 molecules of carbon dioxide and 16 over 23 gives us a respiratory quotient of 0.7. Um, hopefully we're not, we're not burning uh, protein uh, but it would give you a respiratory quotient of about 0.8. There you have it, the respiratory quotient of carbohydrate is 1, of fats 0 0.7. So by measuring the uh, production of carbon dioxide and the use of oxygen, we can work out whether the athlete is burning mostly uh, fats or carbohydrates. You should know that um, as carbohydrate um, use climbs, fat use declines. Uh, and as exercise intensity increases, the body increasingly relies on its first choice fuel. And the first choice fuel of the body is carbohydrates. So as exercise intensity increases, carbohydrate use increases until the respiratory exchange, uh, the respiratory quotient reaches one. Um, and fat metabolism will decline.